test. Test one, two. One, two, one, two. Check. I see the levels. One, two. Check. Check. One, two. One, two. This is Glenda Dawson from Glenda's Dragon's Den. Um, today is a fantastic day. It is nice and sunny, warm. You can hear all the birds singing. Um, our co-host is at an anime convention today, so uh, Ashley's not going to be here with us, but we miss her and hoping she's having a great time. Uh, I have LD at the studio with me. How you doing, LD? I'm doing good. How you doing? <sighs> okay, so again, I'm going to start just by apologizing in advance right now, ahead of time, and... And we're off. And we're off. <laughs> Some of us more off than others. <laughs> I have uh, a very special guest here with us, uh, Deborah Lippian who uh, is the author of Akasha. Um, Unleashed. Unleashed. Yes, Akasha Unleashed. Unleashed, you know, the like me, unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> the dragon is leashed, I'm unleashed. Uh, maybe we should do it the opposite way. I prefer leg chains. Oh, okay. Make sure that they're really tight. Really tight, really tight. Really uh, tight. Yeah, well, uh, snug. Snug, all snug. right. Okay. So, Deborah, how are you today? I'm terrific. I started the day with hearing Don Williams singing, Lord, I hope this day is good. And it's been with me all day. It's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's amazing how sometimes certain songs just sticks to yeah. us through the whole day. And, and sometimes it's not a real a song that you really want it to stick. And you're like trying to find another one. Like, get it out of there. Get it out of there. <laughs> this one was good. Good, good, good. So how... How was your week? My week has been fantastic, but really crazy busy because I'm doing a lot of meetings with people mm -hmm. and I'm doing quite a number of appearances and interviews. Mm -hmm. And it's like the heavens have opened up and all of a sudden people are ready to hear about the Akashic Records. And it's like, woohoo, baby, let's yeah, go. <laughs> there you go, there you go. It's all opportunity and right timing, I yes. always say. And you just came back from a little trip, though, so you were perfect. You went away. You be tripping? You went away, and then, poof, you came back in. Yes. Everything was Oh, perfect. I'm always going on trips. Oh, good for yeah. you. Good I for mean, you. trips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a reader. Yeah, a costume reader. Yeah, I, I, I get it. Wasn't what we were referring to, but I get it. Uh, that's kind of what I do I, when I go to the shore is just sit there and just go out there and get downloads and it's like this is why I come this is why I need my time away from everybody because mm -hmm. you need to recharge so we do have uh, the person who is helping us on the board whose name is Snow and he just waved to everybody <laughs> but he will be chiming in every once in a while I'm sure, if he has a question. So, Deborah, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to this point. How you got to today, actually. Because I, I remember in kindergarten, we started with Fun with Dick and Jane. I don't remember any Akasha Records readers that we got <laughs> trained in. So how did you get started? It's kind of a long story, so I'll, I'll show It's a two-hour show. show. No, it's a two-hour <laughs> show. Go for it. Go for it. Wow. Okay. Yes. Whatever you want to share. Yeah. Well, you know, I was living in Brooklyn mm -hmm. in the I'm sorry. early 2000s, <laughs> right? I'm a queen. And boy. I had this business. I was creating databases for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. About as left brain as it gets, right? Right. Working, going to the city, meeting with clients. And it occurred to me, you know, I'm in my 40s. If I don't get a horse soon, mm -hmm. I'll probably never get one because I grew up with horses. I love horses. I need them in my life. Right. Okay. So what did I do? I went on the internet. 
And I found this horse in Pittsburgh, um, hours and hours away, right, and I yeah. fell in love with her picture, and so I went to meet her, and it's like, this is my dream horse. She's my black beauty. I've got to have her. Mm -hmm. So I had her shipped to Brooklyn. She comes there. There's a stable, believe it or not, in Brooklyn near Prospect Park. There's just, okay, yeah. yes. <laughs> but here's the catch. You have to take the horses through the traffic circle to get to the park, which is so exciting with all these buses backfiring uh, and yes, ambulances yes. and fire trucks. Oh, yes. It's a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> so I had this horse. She's not trained. It must mm -hmm. have been out of my mind. Who does this, <laughs> right? So she but on the other hand, if you train her, then she's definitely your horse. So, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. this way you mm -hmm. two get to bond in a very special way. So, it's you know, I've, I've worked with horses a little bit, and, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Well, in another environment, it might not have been a bad thing, mm -hmm. but this is not necessarily the ideal kind of place to keep horses because it's dark. Right. There's no turnout. You've got to take them out to the park or they're stuck in their stall, mm -hmm. right? And to make matters even more interesting, she got injured on her way to me. Oh, oh. The breeder forgot to train her how to get into a trailer. So oh, when boy. my shipper arrives, it's now shove her, push her, whatever they can do. Mm. When she got to me, she was a shaking mess. Oh. So she was physically and emotionally injured. Oh. And it took a while for all of that to manifest and for mm. me to see what was really going on. But my dream horse turned into a nightmare. People were telling me, you have to send her away for training or you're going to have to put her down. She's dangerous. Oh. And I felt at that point she was trying to kill me because mm. she was so upset. She was just trying right. to communicate. So that set me on this journey of exploration to find things to help her. So I looked for physical modalities. Mm -hmm. I learned so many things. And then I went to an animal communication course. Mm, That's yes. where the story got really interesting right. because the whole class took her on as a project. So we're all talking to her and we're all getting bits and parts of the story. And we find out that she's really ticked off that we took her away from the only home she had ever known, uh -huh. but nobody asked her. Ah. Who thinks about these things? Mm -hmm. I grew up on a farm. You're always having animals in and out and never thought to ask them. Right. What right. a concept. Mm -hmm. So then I began talking to other animals, now yes. that I knew how, yes. and that kind of opened up my gift that had been latent since I was a child. Because I remember it when I was a kid, now that I've reconnected. Right. right. <laughs> and so then I thought, wow, you know, if I can talk to dead animals, I can talk to dead people. Why not? So there I played with go. that for a while. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of cool, but it didn't light me up. I was looking for something else. Right. And so then I tried just channeling. I was listening to Abraham, and Abraham says, you can channel too. And I said, okay, Abraham, I'll try. Damn. And amazingly, things started coming through. But it still wasn't what I was looking for. And then I stumbled on the Akashic Records. And when I started with the Akashic Records, from the very first moment, it was like, the heavens opened, the angels sang. Ah. Okay, <laughs> so home. let me let me stop you there. How did you stumble? What was your path? How did you stumble onto the Akashic Records? I was listening to a lot of telesummits and different speakers, and I was interested in metaphysical because right. I was doing animal communication and channeling. And I happened to listen to a few speakers on Akashic Records, and there was something about it that mm -hmm. just caught my attention. Now, to bring it full circle, Many years before that, I was in therapy, and I had this amazing therapist who did guided visualizations. Right. She, at one point, guided me through one, and once I was in there, it was up to me, right? Right. I get in there, and I'm, I'm in this underwater cave, so I swim up into this cave with a whale and a dolphin, and I climb up, and I walk up these stone stairs carved out of the wall. Mm -hmm. I get to the top. There is a podium there with a book on it and Jesus, and it was the book of life. Uh -huh. I was introduced to the Akashic Records in the 80s, but I didn't have a clue. Yep. Yeah. And it's like, oh my gosh. And then, you know, you put all the pieces together and you look at hindsight. What are databases? The Akashic uh, Records. Exactly. The database in the sky. Exactly. And it's, it, I believe the internet was inspired by the Akashic Records. Because mm. that's what it is. It's like you go and do research. Everything you want to know is there that's, about you. That's very true. Very true. So, so it was all because of a horse. Eh? That's of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we get introduced and our passion gets ignited by the strangest things. Yeah. The strangest things. So then, now, 
you have this horse, you got introduced to communicating with animals and channeling and then Akasha Grower. And how did you f manifest all this passion? Like, how did you finally... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because you know our database, you know our, yeah. our people. Mm -hmm. What happened with the? We got to have some closure to the horse story. Yes, yes. Okay. Before we move because on, because they will. They be will want to know. They will be through through the whole week. What yeah. happened? What happened? Okay. What happened? Yeah. Well, I spent a year walking her in the park between three and five miles every day mm -hmm. until I finally got her saddle trained, mm -hmm. okay. and she became the most amazing partner because I had learned natural horsemanship by that point. Right. We developed a conversation. She started to respect me because, you know, she didn't in the beginning, and right. I had to earn that respect. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had a great time, and then, of course, that inspired me to want to get the heck out of the city. Right. And so then we started shopping, and that's how we ended up in the Poconos. With Wonderful. Our farm. Yeah. Brought the horse out here, and then got her a few friends. Oh, God. Did you ask? <laughs> well, did you ask her first? Before she yes. Was okay. We talked okay. about that. She wanted to get out of that. Okay, but you know, you know, this whole thing started because you didn't ask her first. So I just want to yes. make sure Good that point. now you asked her. Yeah. The only thing she asked of me was, would I keep her for right. a long time? And right. I said, absolutely, and I still have her. Oh, oh good. Oh, that's wonderful. And her friends get along with her, and she gets oh, along yeah. with everybody. Oh, yeah, she's the queen of the herd, <laughs> yeah. She, it turns out, she's got one of these real alpha personalities oh. where you don't mess with her. That's, that's you know, why you, she was yes. very angry. And yes. Like, I'm royalty, and nobody's asked me. You What's negotiate. A, you don't tell her. Yeah, you tell you her, go. forget it. Yeah, I, I, used, really, huh? I used to <laughs> ride quite a bit. I still do. And, you know... There was one mare that I was particularly fond of, but she was alpha. So every time we passed the tree, she's like, let me introduce you to this tree. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we developed a mutual respect for each other. Because I, I used to think I was alpha before her. <laughs> now I have to reconsider at times. Yes. But yeah, no, I understand an alpha horse is... A lot of horse to... It's a challenge. And yes. she was the first alpha I'd ever encountered. Right. That's why I needed the natural horsemanship, because she really was trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we needed that dialogue between us. Right. And I liken it to, think if you go to a, a foreign country and you don't speak the language, how often do you, or how out of place would you feel and kind of isolated, right? right? And so that's what it's like for the animals. Right. And right. once you get that dialogue and you speak their language with... For horses, it's body language. Right. That's what they understand. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh my gosh, we can talk and now I can relax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huge. Exactly. Yeah. And and the fact that you have shown respect, that I'm sure went a long way in, yeah. in her changing, her willingness to work with you. So so tell us about your very first session on Akasha Records. I don't know if it was the very first, but one of the early ones mm -hmm. was really interesting because they were shorter back then, of course, because right. I was getting used to it. Right. And so I went in for this lady because I, I got a bunch of people. I said, I need to practice. Can you let me read for you? And I was, just doing, the, we all yeah, <laughs> I was just doing the channeled ones back then. And so I go in and I get all of this whiteness and it's, you know, very heavenly like feeling. Mm -hmm. And that went on for a few minutes, but basically the message that came through for her was that she was spending way too much time meditating, and the tagline to that was, uh -huh. you're not ready to become ethereal yet. <laughs> so she needed to ground herself right. and come back to earth. Right. And it was really cool because when we talked about it, she's like, yeah, I, I do spend a lot of time, you know, escaping from this world. Right, exactly. Which a lot of us want to, but you're here, you're grounded, and you need to participate. Right, so. right. Yeah, that was one of the early ones that sticks with me. Oh, very good. That's funny. Well, you know, um, it's very interesting because I had never heard of it as, um, until about 15 years ago. And uh, I was like, well, let's, let me go see what it's all about. You know, they were doing one of these uh, group sessions and all that. And I'm like, let me go see what it's all about. And the, the guy looks at me and says, this, this, and this. And I'm like, 
wow, okay. Because that stuff I knew, but nobody else knew about, you know. And it was, like, very interesting. He went right into my database, my file cabinet, as I call it, <laughs> went all the way in the back, pulled out that little folder and said, huh, you were from Egypt, and you were from here, and you did this, and you did that. I'm like, correct. I, I knew it, but I knew it because I knew it, not right. because somebody, you know. So it was like, it was nice affirmation because sometimes, no matter how good we are, when it comes to yourself, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure if that's correct or not. Am I just saying that because I want to, or am I thinking that just because that's what I want? Or it's that what really comes in. And it's only what for yourself, you know, when you're looking into your previous history. And um, it's very interesting, very interesting. I found that that, uh, that day, it, uh, it really opened up a lot more channels for me mm -hmm. because it also widened up the, uh, the way to be able to get the information I needed. So yes. I would then be able to go to him or, or you at now, which I've been trying to get to your monthly meetups <laughs> for about three years. <laughs> <laughs> so it was nice when we finally met in yeah. person. So, um, Speaking of that, okay, how did you get to the book? Well, I took some courses because just my going in and channeling was right. really cool, but I wanted to learn more. Right. So I, I learned how to do a different kind of reading, which is, uh, I call it a soul introduction. Mm -hmm. So I go in, you know, with a pad and paper, essentially, and do research. Right. And I find out, what is your gift? What is your soul specialty? What's your tribe, which, P.S., is your originating planet? Right. Because most <laughs> of us are not from Earth. And so I get this whole long list of things. And then I get to share it with this person. And it's like, when you share with them about all these amazing aspects of their soul, they're like, oh, really? That's me? Right. Because it's that astounding. There right. are things we never knew. And usually, it's things that you criticize yourself for that you think are shortcomings, and they turn out to be your gift. Mm -hmm. Like, you probably procrastinate a lot. Yes. And that's actually part of your gift because you're very energetically sensitive uh -huh. and the way you function is you have this concept of perfection that's up here uh -huh. that's not realistic <laughs> I know <laughs> and that's why you procrastinate because right. you can't reach it right. and so for people with your gift what I always tell them mm -hmm. is you need to find that space of good enough and mm -hmm. learn to accept it mm -hmm. and stop torturing yourself for crying out loud yeah <laughs> that's my job <laughs> damn it yes I, um, I used to say, don't worry, you don't meet, need to be the critic. You don't even need to tell me how to do it or how good I did it because I'm my worst crit mm -hmm. own critic. I have to, everything has to be just right. Even a, handing a picture has to be just, and then it has to equal over here. And, and it's like, just close your eyes, put it up there, walk away. <laughs> Yeah. It's giving yourself permission to be good enough yeah. and let yeah. it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so that was how it happened. I, I studied that, and I started doing the soul introductions, and then I developed a few different kinds of reading of my own. Right. I do a birthday reading that's really fabulous because on your birthday, mm -hmm. your guides have a party, whether you're there or not. Right. And they archive last year's records, and they start the new natal year. Nice. So if you show up, Yep. and ask for a birthday reading, uh -huh. oh my gosh, who knows what you're going to get. I got Jesus in a tuxedo dancing with me. We were dancing to a little bitty pretty one <laughs> and doing the Lindy Hop. <laughs> and I know, ridiculous, right? But it was, it's, to, it's funny. It's, they have such a sense of humor. Oh, it's yes. to make you laugh and feel yes. special. Yes. And then we start dancing a waltz and... Oh my gosh, the energy of that waltz. We were floating. Oh, and it's, oh, uh -huh. I can't right? Yep. You yes. know, a lot of people don't get it, but I just posted in a number of different groups that I'm active in on that article about the guy that fell in at 4 a.m. to the Niagara Falls and then they found him alive on a rock. And my caption was, the archangels have a 
very interesting sense of humor. Yes. And, you know, people, how can you talk about the archangels like that? I'm like, hey, you know, they need to loosen up, too. <laughs> They, I'm always getting that message. Yeah. You people are too serious. Yeah. Lighten yeah. up already. Yeah. You came here to have a good time. Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, Abraham says, happy, 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 dead. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's what we're going for. So yeah. the birthday readings are cool. You just don't know. And that one, then we ended up with, um, I'm hearing the, the courtship of Eddie's father theme song, Let Me Tell You About My Best Friend. <laughs> Then James Comack, I believe. Film premiere. Oh. And on the marquee, mm -hmm. it says Deborah, voice of the Akashic Records. And I'm like, okay, now this is getting weird. Uh -huh. And so we go in, and Jesus is the MC, and there's this movie which I don't get to see. And when uh -huh. it's all over, we come out, and I'm like, I didn't get to see the movie. And they said, You haven't lived it yet. Ah. Okay. 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 And this was all because this whole voice of the Akashic Records thing is new. I only got this recently. It was my up level. Ah, and nice. so I'm being asked to go out mm -hmm. and spread the word, which takes us back to the question you initially asked about the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the book was divinely inspired because as I reached out and I met new people and talked mm -hmm. to them, I discovered a lot of people have never even heard about the Akashic Records. Right. And it's their birthright. It is your missing manual. You should have had it since birth yeah because it's your guide what do you do when your car breaks down you look in the manual or you go to a mechanic, mechanic yeah. right so what if we had a manual since we were born mm -hmm. that we could look things up oh my gosh imagine how our lives would have been different yes so and how a like, manual's life would be different <laughs> well that's true too yeah so that yes. was the book it was like you've got to get the word out to tell people that this resource exists right and it's available to them and it's it's wonderful that you're you took this on, and it's wonderful that you're actually spreading the word about it because I could tell you there's a lot of people who don't know it, don't understand it, um, and by n them not understanding, explain a little bit more about it, if you could. Well, give her a little push yeah. in what direction you're looking for her to go in. Cause well, kind of like a more of a description so people when you see somebody and you're trying to explain it to them how what? does it roll out i think is what she's trying to ask yeah. yeah well it's interesting you told the story about the file and the, mm -hmm. the guide reading right because i rarely get that and so mm -hmm. we all get it in different ways right. which is really cool too right. Right. right and so a lot of people think i'm going to go into the akashic records and i'm going to open a book and read it right i've never had that experience mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. i'm very visual Right. So I get movies, right? right? So the very first time I mm -hmm. used this new process that I had learned to go in, I walk in and it looks like the New York Public Library. It's vast. Mm -hmm. And they have the old-fashioned card catalog. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking at that. I'm talking to the guide and I'm leaving the library and meeting people. And then further down the road, then all of a sudden one day I go in, mm -hmm. card catalog's gone, there's a table with a computer that's the help desk. <laughs> so we're evolving, <laughs> there right? There you go. <laughs> and now I rarely see the library. It's usually go in and there's some kind of a, a scene and it goes from there. And right. I get this whole story. Right. And then through the, the story and the symbols comes the message. Mm -hmm. Very good. So Very good. you might see that. Right. So when you go in and try it for yourself, for those newbies who haven't done it, the very first time you might get nothing. You might get a color, you might get a feeling, whatever it is, accept it and go with it. And then keep practicing because you get more and more each time you do it, it evolves, mm -hmm. right? And just be open to it being whatever it is because your experience won't be the same as my experience. Right, right. That's very true, that's very true. And, and I'm a pretty much visual like you, so that's why I was able to see a file cabinet mm -hmm. and the person you know, opening the drawer and, Visual, like you're a former paralegal. <laughs> you that deal too. in files. That too. And that is probably why I saw it that way, because I am a yeah. former paralegal. And it, it's like all the, the filing cabinet, all the files and everything. And I'm like, ha, huh, okay. And then he opens it up. And then I'm like, interesting, very interesting how, and I did not realize, and that's a good point, that each one of us would see it differently or yeah. feel it or just know it or whatever using 
all of our senses, so probably, also. Mm -hmm. Now, when you used to do your readings before you got into the records, did you see them the same way? Was it in pictures and movies when you used to read people? And no, it was very different. It was more audio. I would hear things. Okay. And I wasn't tuned in enough to really feel things at that point. Right. It was like there was a veil, mm -hmm. and the information that came through, I always questioned it. I couldn't trust it. Mm -hmm. But when I went to the Akashic Records, I instantly trusted it because it's different. The right. energy is different, and it's all love and light mm -hmm. and truth that mm -hmm. is in the Akashic Records. There's no darkness. Right. So mm -hmm. it was easy to trust it and allow it mm -hmm. to blossom. Very good. Yes. So, would it be fair to say that when you're doing a reading, even uh, of someone who's deceased, even if they've crossed over, there's still that human pollution that kind of hampers and, and weighs it down, weighs the frequency down, but when you get up to the Akashic level, then you're at a higher frequency and you're closer to the cosmic consciousness and... and where everything is love, and is, is yeah. that a fair presumption? Yeah. And a good example of that is when I was doing animal communication. Because mm -hmm. again, you're getting stuff and you don't know if it's real or not. Right. And I'm like, oh, can I tell this person that? I don't know if they're gonna believe me. It's scary doing this stuff, <laughs> right? Yes, and so I <laughs> when I went to the records, mm -hmm. I just shared whatever came through. Right. So when I did contact somebody who was deceased, I found that energy was very different because it's through the filter of the Akashic Records. Right. And it was a whole different experience. Right. Really so no, true. I wouldn't do it any other way. Right. Well, good for you, good for you. The passion, and you could tell the passion. Well, it's also a frequency. Right. She's now, like she said, it was an upgrade. An upgrade. Yes. And you know, when you have the upgrade, why lower your frequency to, I mean, for what? Exactly. You're already there, so. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you read someone on whatever level you're reading them, and I presume it's through Akashic now, they're totally exposed, am I correct? I mean, you see everything about that person if they've come to you and they've no. opened up. No, because that would be invading their privacy. Okay. So I'm going into their record, and I'm if they've got questions, I'm asking those questions. Okay. The rest I don't care about. Mm -hmm. And it's not up to me what it is. I'm just translating whatever comes through because their guides know what they need and they'll get exactly that so that's the other thing if you're going to do this right. for somebody you have to be faithful and relay every detail because who knows what's important and what's not right i have had a lot of challenge with people because you know glenda is very gifted and i got a couple in my pocket and you know sometimes someone will well you're a psychic why don't you know that and i say I don't live in your head, mm -hmm. and you don't want me living in your head. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you what I'm told to give you, no more, no less, so you can relax, you know, I, I'm not going to dredge up stuff that doesn't really matter, and most of it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people that go out there because there are people that abuse it. Mm, the gifts, yes. And, you know... I, I call them in general psychic snitches because they'll they'll read somebody without permission and I mean Glenda even had someone who was famous try to do it to her and you know she's <laughs> she knows when it happens and she has her way of you know spanking them <laughs> uh, but it, it amazes me how many people don't have that respect yeah. at that level um, so how do you know you know this is a question we get a lot how do you know that you can trust the person that you're employing to do this? Well, I guess you get recommendations is a good way. Mm -hmm. Maybe you read some of their work. Mm -hmm. But what I recommend is go to your solar plexus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we yeah. were designed to feel our way through life, not think our way through life, because right. then ego gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So you have this built-in compass in your solar plexus. And this is what they taught me. I didn't learn right. this anywhere, so it's really cool. Mm -hmm. So this compass is there, and if you feel whatever the choice is through your solar plexus, you will soon learn to distinguish what's good and what's not good. Right. But mm -hmm. otherwise, you, maybe you just have to try it and see, does it resonate? Does it feel true? Yeah, we've, we've had a couple of shows on this subject. And, you know, I basically, when we were talking about the people that are not faithful to greatest good, 
I said, when you walk in there, if it doesn't feel right, get the hell out. Yeah. Yes. You know, that's your first line of defense. If it makes you feel relaxed and comfortable and light, then you're probably okay. But if anything doesn't feel right, get the hell out. Yeah. It's really a call to consciousness. Yes. Because I was so unconscious for so many years. <laughs> I know the difference. Yeah. And it's like you have to take that responsibility of being conscious and being aware mm -hmm. and feeling it yeah. and then making informed choices. Yeah, that's true. Now, do you recall what it was that suppressed your gift? In other words, you know, a lot of us, I think, come into this world with one foot in each world. And then things happen, and we're taught to suppress the gift. Are you aware of any of that in your life, of at what point you were sort of encouraged to, you don't talk to the imaginary friend, they're not really there, or anything like that that, you know, because when you say you were unconscious for a long time, it occurs to me that a lot of times that's, Nurture. I don't recall it being suppressed, but mm -hmm. what I've learned since then is that I incarnated with a massive amount of victim energy because I was murdered by my husband in the most previous life. Mm. An abusive man mm -hmm. chased me down this car and killed me because I was trying to leave him. Mm. And ironically, I married that same man in this lifetime, so I got <laughs> that whole victim thing going on. Uh -huh. But I was born with that victim energy because, you know, we bring it forward. We have to resolve it. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a young person, I went through physical, sexual, emotional abuse. Right. I think that's what shut it down, right? Because yeah. you've got to go internal to protect yourself. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I was kind of like not really in this world. I was kind of removed from it for a good part of my life. So you you created your own cocoon for self-preservation yeah. right. because you hadn't resolved the previous victim energy. And do you find that victim energy attracts Abuse? Yeah. Yes. When people talk about, how do these little kids attract abuse? Well, they do because they had the karmic energy that needed to be resolved, right? right? And it was my opportunity to learn from that and grow and eventually stop being a victim. Right. And stand up and develop some self-esteem and love myself. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and that took until my 50s. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that was on my mind to ask you, which you pretty much answered now, is why, you know? I, in the paranormal, a lot of people get caught up in dead things. And, you know, while it's nice to be able to create greatest good through that, we're also here to evolve. And you can't evolve living in the past, but you also have to resolve what you bring from the past. So... You've just kind of answered the, the question of, well, why does someone want to go back into past lives and, and dredge all that crap up? So how far back do you find it's necessary to go? Because you said this was your immediate past life. Yeah. But people can carry this forward from lifetime to lifetime yeah. if they don't resolve it. So how far back would you say you've helped someone go to find the root cause of their karmic upset or the, challenge? Most of them are like 20 or less lifetimes that come up, but I, I don't ask for that. I just go in and it's given to me. Right. So whatever comes is what they're ready to resolve because, right. oh my gosh, if you tried to do it all at once, it'd kill you. Uh -huh. Right? So I trust that they're giving just what that person's ready for now. Mm -hmm. So the healing happens in layers. But the oldest one, it's really this amazing story. It started in 4900 BC. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't even know how many lifetimes ago that was because I didn't ask. If, oh, right. that, my head is having trouble wrapping around that. Right. Mm -hmm. But there was this planet Maldek. Okay. And my client was this lady who, she was a Palladium. Right. And she had somehow visited Maldek and fallen in love with this guy. And the Maldetians were this very angry, warring race of people. Right. And they were in the process of about to blow up their planet, and she tried to intervene and help them. Mm -hmm. The planet blew up anyway, and the leader of the planet blamed her. He started chasing her through lifetime after lifetime. Oh. We came up like five different stories where he showed up in her life, and he 
killed her. He tortured her. He made her life a living, you know what, oh, until she was gone. And oh my gosh, why would a soul give up their journey to go on this vendetta for life? I mean, this is a lot of lifetimes <sighs> we're talking about. But this was the leader of the planet, and he just had a hate on for her. So it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we're getting this now. You can resolve it. Mm -hmm. And all these problems you're having at work, that's all connected. And once you do that clearing, yeah. you can step out of that now. You know, it's like a snake shedding its skin. Yeah. When yeah. you learn, you transform, you get out of that old skin, and now you're new. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. I've actually gone back to my Palladium uh, adventures. That far back they went. And uh, it's interesting. It's... Um, it, it makes you understand a lot more of what you're going through in this lifetime. Yeah. And it makes you also understand why you did things and what the way you did them earlier in your life. And it also has helped me pick my battles, mm -hmm. as they say. You know, you look at some and you're like, you know what, Psst, not today. I don't care. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you got this one today. Uh, doesn't make any difference for me. And that is very hard to do. Pick your battles. Pick which battles are really important to yeah. you and which ones are not. And that's one of the things I had to learn. And so I was very thankful that this man actually went in there and said, well, this. And I'm like, okay. Got it after you know you're thinking about it and you you just enable the healing. That's another thing because just because you hear it, mm -hmm. is uh, that like empowering the healing? Uh, kind of. Okay, you know yeah. how I feel about that word. Yes, I know how you feel, <laughs> but it just allowing the healing to actually take place because you could hear whatever you hear. But unless you're really willing to listen, because a lot of people don't. They hear it, but they don't listen. Yeah. Uh, you know, they well, the amazing it. thing about this is it takes you to the root of the problem. Yeah. Whatever that pattern is that's showing up in your life. Right. Like, I get a call from this lady one day, and she says, my life is crap. My job is crap. My relationships are crap. My family is crap. That's okay. a lot of crap, right? Yes. And so when I go in, I'm shown this story of her... She's about four years old. She's wearing this bedraggled nightgown, this white gown. She's standing on a cobblestone street. Uh -huh. It looks like it's maybe turn of the century England. Okay. Horse and carriage is going by. Mm -hmm. And runny nose. But it's like she's invisible. All these people are just walking by and not noticing this wave. Right. So she goes and she sits by this building. And she's there with her knees crouched up. And as she's just about to die, this man walks by. And he stops to scrape a little dog poop off of his shoe. Uh -huh. Her dying thought, dog poop is more important than I am. Wow. Well, okay. There you go. Boy, now we understand why everything is crap. Right. Literally. Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then they went on to show her the future mm -hmm. that could be potential. Because right. they never tell you, of course. It's like these are potentials. Right. And they showed this man coming, this beautiful man, and a family gathering, and just a really lovely life. So when I talked to her three months later, it was like she'd had a personality transplant, different person. She's in a relationship. Good. Life yeah. is good. She needed to hear. And the, but the astounding thing about it for me is that I didn't really do anything special. It's hearing the story because it's the root. Right. And it's like you just pulled up the weed. Mm -hmm. Now that you've got it, you know where it started, you can release it. Exactly. Very good. Yes, I, I love these. We do have a question. Uh, Johnny from CORE. Um, hey, Johnny. Yes. Uh, CORE Paranormal. He wants to know what... Okay, curious what Deborah feels about programmed reality and your uptake on the Akashic being part of all that. Programmed reality? Program reality. I'm not sure what that means. Are you talking about like the Matrix? Uh, that's probably what he's Because I kind of think sometimes maybe that's true. 
<laughs> is it real or is it Memorex? Right, right. That's good. There you go. Because, you know, there are times when I'm journeying in the Akasha right. that I want, is this the reality and is that the dream? Because uh -huh. it, it's so visceral. Oh, so, vi yes. So real. Surreal. Surreal. Definitely. Let me see. And there's another question. Uh, one more here. Oh, how do past victimization and trauma get resolved? How do they get resolved? Well, yes. first it's figuring out the root. Because when you get that root story, like as a light worker, mm -hmm. you know this. Yes. Many of us have been hiding most of our lives because we were killed and maimed and tortured in so many previous lives. Right. <laughs> so one time my guides showed me this story where I was in probably the Salem witch trial era, mm -hmm. and there I am being drowned on a dunking stool. Oh, oh boy. And so, okay, that's just one of a thread of times I was killed for being a light worker, which explains why this was really hard for me to come out, because I was hiding for a long time. Oh, in fact, I years ago, before I had even connected, right. I heard this voice out of nowhere say, you're always hiding, and I didn't have a clue what it meant. Mm -hmm. Now I get it. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. connect with you when you have those little openings yep. and those threads, right? There's like these threads that go through our lives mm -hmm. that connect all these things, people and places and events, too. Right, right. And nice. then one day you start making these connections. So it's learning the story right? and then releasing it. Intentions are huge. Yes. So if your intention is, okay, now I know. Yeah. Now I'm going to let it go and I'm going to allow myself right. to heal. Mm-hmm. And, and make better choices. Right. And it's yourself. That doesn't, anybody who's around you that is involved in the trauma and the abuse and all that, they have to do their own work. Mm -hmm. It's you who has to do Well, your, your own. energy will shift. Right. And so you can't change them, right. but simply by shifting your own energy, they have to change to match you. Right. Or leave. Yeah, that's true. You know, some people find that when they do their own work and mm -hmm. they shift, all of a sudden, these troublesome people just disappear. Yes. It, you know, oh, yes. <laughs> when I used to do my coaching work, the f one of the first questions I would ask a lot of my clients, because a lot of my clients had no identification with themselves. They were getting their self-esteem from their daughter and their son and their husband and their father and their mom. And I'm like, okay, so how many lives are you living to avoid living yours? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. and that, just asking that question alone, and I didn't ask it like that, because, you know, that's, that's a little more confrontative than I've been with most of my clients, but just bringing that question up and having them look at it, because the next question is, okay, well, you get this one life, it's your life, when do you want to start living your life? And let them do their own work yeah. and stop enabling. That's why I have a problem with that <laughs> word. And stop enabling them to depend upon you to do their work. So, you know, I, I find all of this fascinating. How about the flip side? What's the shortest journey you've made with someone in Akasha? Well, I do once a month a live mm -hmm. channeled event that I invite my list to. And... On that, everybody gets to ask a question. Mm -hmm. So some of them are just a couple of minutes. But what I mean to say is you have one person that you went back 4,700 B.C., mm -hmm. which is effectively 6,700 years in, in Earth time because we're at over 2,000 A.D. What's the shortest number of lifetimes you've encountered doing an Akashic reading? Well, some are just the previous, the most recent. Right. Often, they're within the first five. Mm. It just depends. Now, I find since I got my upgrade, I'm getting more that are further back. So that just is that could because be... the people are coming that yeah. were ready for it that weren't before? Am I attracting right. them? I don't know. Mm. I or the people the are coming that you're ready for that you weren't yeah. before. Right. Well, here's a funny thing. I was thinking about this earlier. All of a sudden, I'm getting more people coming who are from Polaris. Ah, uh, yes. And it... Why? Why all of a sudden, in all these years, I've gotten very few of them? And then it connected because Polaris is the North Star, yes. and Earth is in trouble. Yes. And they're all about being steady and loyal and constant and trying to fix the Earth. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, now yeah. I get it. You know, so sometimes 
I'm dense. I don't get it. It takes a while for it to come through, but eventually it does. Well, I don't know that we're dense. I, I think we're kind of have a predisposition to be focused and a little myopic. Yeah. Um, I think that particularly before you upgrade and before you open your mind up, you're just trying to deal with the now and, and wrap your head around the now. And another thing I've discussed with my clients is, okay, that's, that's the little picture. That's the minutia. And there's an old saying, God is in the details. What about the big picture? Will this matter tomorrow? Will this matter next week, next month, next year, five years, 10 years? What is the ultimate goal? And then work backwards and engineer backwards to where you want to get to to be there then. So I, I just think that, you know, when I went to school, we had to walk on the right side of the hall mm -hmm. and we had to get a hall pass and we had to stand in size places, which, you know, they didn't do a thing for width. It was all height. But, you know, it, it, there was a lot of programming for us to fit into the box to become a good citizen. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember one of the things, it didn't strike me at the time because, again, I was just trying to get through because as it was, I got my second grade teacher fired. But uh, we did The House I Live In, which was a film basically about being open to everybody except them Japs. <laughs> And Frank Sinatra actually did the film and sang the song. And, you know, it was a whole World War II. Okay, but, you know, everybody's cool except them Japs. But everybody else is cool. And um, we did this in grade school. And Yamiko Aikuda <laughs> had to sing that song. And I'm like, you know, in retrospect, did she even know? Did her parents know? And if they knew, you know, did they just go along with it? or So... There's this whole process of trying to get everyone to fit into their box. And I think it's wonderful that you are dedicated to helping people come out of that box. Yeah. That comes up a lot in ratings. My last live event, I'm getting a picture for this lady. She's in something that looks like a grain silo, but it's empty. Right. And so she's in the dark and she's walking around. She's feeling the wall, trying to find a way out. She can't find a way out. All of a sudden... Mm -hmm. This helicopter flies over, and they drop down one of these contraptions that she can strap on, right. and they pull her up out. And then they go flying across the land, and they cross the darkness, they cross the water, and then they let her down in this beautiful meadow. And it was such a beautiful metaphor for coming out of the darkness into the light, right. going through the hardship, yeah. right? Yeah. And the whole point for her was that there were doors there. You just couldn't see them. Right. You could have looked up. Probably mm -hmm. was a ladder. But, you know, when you're in that panic state and you don't know what to do, you don't see the rescue that's right there waiting for you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, boxes, a lot. Mm. Let's come out. And a lot of times you don't feel you have the right to ask for it. Right. That's and so, another thing. Yeah, that, that's another wonderful gift that you bring to your clients is that, you know, well, when are you ready? Let's, let's do this. You know, let's let's find the way to where you want to be. And and that's the beauty of being a light worker for me is you get to get to that route. You know, I, I did a lot of work with mental health. I was on two boards of directors of two different agencies and I got to wrestle with the New York State legislature on a number of things. But what I brought to it was, okay, somebody comes to you, you're diagnosing them and you're medicating them instead of finding out what the root cause is. Yeah. Right. You know, and for all you know, the root cause may be something greater than even you can wrap your mind around, but everybody's been suppressing that. So, you know, it, there was some interesting discussions in front of the legislature about this. But it's really wonderful to see the evolution and look at the polarity of the evolution because on one side you've got the light workers and on the other side you've got the military industrial complex mm -hmm. yeah. trying to get everybody to walk on the right side of the hall and 
get back into your nice little box, like I told you. And, and you know, like I said, even in second grade, they couldn't get me in a box. And I wasn't even this big. So. Well, what it's come to at this point is, I tell people very often, you're not pizza. You don't belong in a box. And it's time now to question everything. Mm -hmm. Because all these rules that we've been taught, if they don't serve us, they're not our rules. For instance, when I was taught to do these soul introduction readings, I was told you have to ask for the full name at birth, the present name, right. where they were born, and uh, like a list of things. And over time, it, it just didn't feel right to me. And mm -hmm. so I started experimenting, and I found that's not true at all. I can read for you with just your first name. Yep. I can even read for you with a nickname because it's energy and intention. Right. And that set me on this whole thing of questioning all these things I had been taught. If yes. it doesn't work for me, why would I do it? Why go to all that extra effort? Exactly. It's even the same way as, you know, when they were teaching me formally tarot. I read tarot completely different than people do. What? I just, I read completely different. Huh? I just, <laughs> sh quiet. I don't do certain type, don't do certain form, that I just put them down and get the energy, get the yes. messages that are coming through. And you you could be getting a, a card that's the death card, and it could bring completely something different than the actual meaning that is written that it mm -hmm. is for. That's just a tool, and that's what You know what, what that reminds do. me of? You know how you learn to type? Yes. And you read the letters and you're pushing. Right. And then one day you stop thinking and it just flows. Yes. It's like that. And exactly. It, what, that's what you brought to your tarot reading. Right. That was your gift evolving. Right. Because and it's beautiful. And now I throw three cards down and half of the times I'm already connecting with somebody on, yeah. on, for them. And I'm like, okay, so you need this, this, and you did this, and you did that. And they're looking at me like, you got that from that? That doesn't mean that, I, said, I didn't tell you I was going to tell you what that meant. I told, I told you you were going to get what you needed to hear. Mm -hmm. What they're telling me, your higher self is telling me, hey, this is the time, this is the way, you need to change directions, and this is the only way that you're going to get them to stop, look, and listen. Yeah. Well, do you want the truth, or do you want what these cards say? Exactly. Exactly. Because the cards they're are just... They're just a focus point. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I tell... I tell everybody, that's just to keep your right of, this, of the mind busy. That's just so, or the left side, that's just so your monkey mind can look at something while your higher self is actually talking to me. Yeah. And um, everybody looks at me like, what? That's it. And I teach. <laughs> I teach tarot. And I tell them, I'm going to teach you the way I was taught, and then I'm going to teach you the way to expand and re uh, evolve your gift. I love that. Get out of the box. Yeah, get out of the Use box. Use your gift. Yeah. yeah. Use your gift because, you know, then you're just like anybody else. You're just a data input person. You're not a bring what they're actually saying from the other side to you. Uh, it's, it's very interesting with all these different ways of doing the same, exact same thing. And we're going to go to a commercial break. Oh, somebody asked a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody was asking if uh, what you was talking about with the past lives correlates to deja vu. I didn't hear the last part. Deja correlates vu. to deja, deja vu. Deja vu. The, the feeling Is it connected of, to deja vu? Yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you feel that, and in that moment, it's because it's something in a past life, mm -hmm. or maybe you've dreamed it, but it's probably connected to a past life, right. and you're just feeling it. And it's like... It's an invitation from your guides. Hello, we're here. We want to connect with you. Right. Wake up. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's Very, what it's like. That's beautiful. Yes. Um, let's see. The root... Oh, here's somebody else. The root cause should always be instrumental. Anything before that is nothing more than the Band-Aid. Okay. Over cancerous boils. Okay, thanks, Johnny. <laughs> hey, Johnny. Yo. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's part of my belief system there, buddy. <laughs> Is Johnny one of your regulars? Johnny's done the show twice. Uh, okay. He heads a local paranormal group. Yes. And one awesome. of the things they've done is investigated the theater across the street. Sure. And, you know, Glenda and I, in our remediation and resolution, because we don't call it what we do, investigation, 
because she knows what's there before we even show up. We practice a very high level of respect for the entity. Right. You know, we don't go in there to deal with. We go in there to, like you did with your horse. Right. Um, and a lot of paranormal groups have a lot of arrogance about it, and Johnny mm -hmm. does not. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of symbiotic understanding that John and I have in the big picture, big guy, okay? In the big picture, <laughs> we have symbiotic. But, you know, belief systems being what they are. And, and, you know, that's why I love the word belief system because it's nice to have a belief system. A lot of people believe in a lot of things. But when you're an experiencer, <laughs> you know, people don't get that you're a kind of moving above a belief system. You know, when you know, it's like, I know the sun's going to rise tomorrow. You know, I don't believe it. I know it, you know. It may be a little later. It may be a little earlier because we're moving past the equinox. But it's going to rise. <laughs> And you may not see it that well because of the clouds, but it's still out there. <laughs> so. And I don't need to see it right. because I know. Yeah, but uh, at what I like about all of the different modalities that light workers use is that we are all trying to do greatest good, and we are all trying to get to the end point of trying to heal mm -hmm. the earth as a whole. Wait a minute. Not every light worker is doing greatest good. Well, I, no, then they're okay. not light workers. By well, the but they call themselves light, light workers. And I just want to make the point that, you know, people who are not necessarily involved intimately in what we do and, un and know us don't see light worker on the internet and go, oh, I can trust that person. They're greatest good. Right. You know, again, trust trust your internal feeling and sense, and you know, make in, your own decision. Internal meter. Yeah. As I yes, call it. I always tell people, you know, I'm sharing with you what I have learned, what right. my guides have taught me. Right. If it resonates, awesome. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Yeah. You know, we all come to our own ideas about what truth is, and that's mm -hmm. that's honoring yourself. Right. Exactly. And. You may tell them something that, even though their guy, your guys and their guys are telling you he's they're ready, they may not be really ready for resistance. It. Resistance baby. that wall <laughs> that they put up. I mean, even when I do Reiki, a lot of people go in there and say, "Oh yes, I want Reiki," and I I feel that wall, and I'm like, "Okay, let let's go through this wall. Some mm -hmm. something's got to give." And, you know, and I tell them, trust the process. Yeah. You have to trust it. You're coming in here for, for raking. You're coming in here for healing. Then trust it. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm just asking you to trust the process. Because anybody really who studies and gets attuned can get Reiki. But it's all a matter of whether you allow it or not, truthfully yeah. and truly. You have to receive it. Exactly. You have to be willing to receive it. And, you know, I laugh because I've been involved in a number of different groups on Facebook and otherwise. And, you know, you get the people, ah, you know, that's a fake, you're a fake, it's all a fake. And I'm like, well, you know, that's what you want to believe, and I'm not here to change you or what you want to believe. That's your life. When you're ready to change, come see me. But I love her because she's very evidentiary and she'll tell people things that you know like she's been told she couldn't possibly know it won't be stuff you can go out and you know you, you see these things where a reader does a reading for free and then they pull a curtain and there's 10 people back there connected <laughs> to the internet and googling stuff and all that but you know she she can really get into the important details so that the client knows they're connected, and then once they realize that it's the real deal, then she can begin to work on the healing and, and give the actual message. But it's, it's fun for me to watch because, you know, I've been doing this for years, and 
I've seen people literally on their deathbed who have very little conscious cognitive activity, cognitive activity. But all of a sudden, they'll channel somebody on the other side of the world who's in danger. And a lot of times, you know, the staff will laugh it off or whatever, mm -hmm. and they'll get more agitated, more agitated, and the staff will want to hospitalize them because they can't. And I'll go in there and say, okay, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I will look into it, and I will faithfully follow it up, and I will let you know what I find out. And then they calm down, and then, you, then the fun starts, because then you find it, and then you tell that person, well, you know, your, your Aunt Marion, who's on her deathbed, told me you were in trouble. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and you see that aha moment. Yes. And I, I think that's what we're all kind of, that's our subtle pain at payoff, is those aha moments when all of a sudden the client is like, oh. <laughs> yes. And especially when, like you do, you go back into their previous lives and to their, and now with the upgrade, you could probably go all the way back to their original existence moment and tell them things that resonate with them because I'm telling you, when, once I got told the stuff I got told, I was like, oh, that all makes sense mm -hmm. now. It's like that missing puzzle piece. And it just hits and it's like, now I understand why this, this, and this. Yes. You know, and, I, and it's like, Huh. And all this time I would thought it was that and it's really you know, like for example, I was very, very afraid of water. And yes, in this lifetime I drowned at Cesar Heights under Toe Took Me. But even before that, I would go to like five steps into the water. I would not go any further than that. I didn't want it to go anywhere near my my waist. Oh no, that's too high. So it would always be like my knee, my thigh, which isn't, you know how short I am. That isn't a lot. But <laughs> she's short, people. For those of you that don't know, she's but, short. You know. Four eight. She's short. And the undertow took me out, and I was officially declared dead, and they had to paddle me and the whole thing. But he basically said that I had been drowned before, murdered, mm -hmm. you know, with my head in the water and the whole thing. And I'm like, that makes sense. Now I understand why I would be so afraid of water when I never had any trauma before that that incident, but I never had any trauma, never had any problems. It was always peaceful. I enjoyed the baths. I enjoyed the showers. I enjoyed, you know, swimming in the little pools. Even when I used to go to the beaches, it was still, I enjoyed it. It wasn't, and then it's like, oh, okay. Now I understand. There you go. There's that missing puzzle piece. But I still wonder if there aren't pieces of you in Area 51, because you <laughs> still don't want to fly. Like Just that. saying. <laughs> <laughs> never know. Never yeah. Know, never know. You know, maybe that was, you know, 4-8. I don't know. Uh, oh, but, yeah. Wow. Oh. oh. Help me. All I can say is I am probably hesitant to fly because I really am afraid of my energy sometimes. So not afraid, but healthy respect for it. Sometimes I could drain telephones, cell phones that have been charged completely. I have Drain hell. She shatters the damn screens. <laughs> I shattered. Yes. I just go like, th uh, like that and woof. The whole thing. And not intentionally, because they're usually hers. <laughs> right. <laughs> it cost me a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> but so. Don't piss off the little girl. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. <laughs> so I really get healthy respect and saying yeah. to myself, I'm going to be up there. If I'm having one of those very energetic days, um, yeah, maybe not. Maybe I should just drive. <laughs> So it would be really fun to experiment with ways to 
put a boundary, mm. a protective bubble around you to, not necessarily in this case to protect you from the outside, but <laughs> from the nurse, <laughs> right. which is what we normally do the other right. way. But right. I wonder if you could do that. I'll bet you could. Oh, Because intention, be right? Yes, intention. That would be something to do. I'm going to practice that. And this way I could save a lot of money. <laughs> so let's just say when you do that, you, you put can't touch this on, on your ringtone so I know and I don't hurt myself, but <laughs> ooh, ow. <laughs> He's talking about well, one time I, we were doing, I was the, the mentor and I was watching my students do a Reiki level three attunement. So I energetically closed the room and to the point where the cats couldn't come in, they would bounce off my energy wall. And the, I was like, oh, you didn't tell me you had cats. You didn't tell me you had animals. And then once I released the, for the animals, yeah, the cats were able to come in. but. We were talking about that a couple of times where the, the people there, even the, the woman who was getting the attunement was like looking like, I've heard of that, but I've never seen it. I'm like, well, I'm going to be in here wide open, and you're going to be wide open, and my students are here. I'm going to make sure everything is energetically kosher. <laughs> and it's particularly when she does mediumship, because when she does the mediumship development, it's basically an open clinic for people that want to help heighten their awareness mm -hmm. and, and develop their gifts. So she generally doesn't pick and choose who walks in. Obviously, if somebody walks in who's intentionally chaotic, which has happened, they're mm -hmm. I, I, invited I, to leave. Yes, I have invited people to leave. Uh, they don't but, respect. But everything, again when it's called in is for greatest good so that no chaos can come into the actual arena to right. interfere or harm anyone in there. Right. So I know she can do it. It's just a matter of thinking about it. You got to remember. Right. 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 Was exactly. mediumship your first gift? Uh, mm, well, walking was her first gift. Walking was my first gift. Yes. At age of two. That's the earliest I like to talk about. I remember things before that, but I only go at the age of two. Um, I was told, and my parents were told, by many, many experts that I was not going to be able to walk. Prior to the age right. of two. And I was sitting in my usual rocking chair in my front porch in my house the afternoon, and I saw three archangels, and they said, get up and walk. And I'm like, come on, you know I can't do it. And one of them... For, kind of took my hand, forced me, and I went to my... They didn't force you. Yeah, they encouraged you. you. Yeah, they they empowered you. <laughs> and then I went to my mother. My mother, of course, screamed and fainted. But that is what star I realized at that point that it wasn't really imaginary friends mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody used to say, oh, you should have your imaginary friend. And I'm like... Yeah, but they got cool costumes. What do you mean they're imaginary friends? Because you know? they, they came with their full gear and, you know, the whole thing. And I'm like, but they look cool. What are you talking about, imaginary friends? They're real. So I knew they were real. But I just had to keep it quiet for a very long time. The world was not ready for you at two. No. <laughs> and I started at five. But interestingly enough, because I'm older... We started at about the same time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In chronological time. So, yeah, the, I, I kid, she hates it. I say, between the two of us, we have over 100 years' experience. <laughs> but, you know, and, and people look at you like, wait a minute. Yeah. I, I'm 80. <laughs> I look really good for my age. I'll take that. I'll take that. But, no. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because both of us had a very challenging upbringing and childhood and life until we were able to move into this aspect so getting back to you because you are the guest yes. you know we had a show about us everybody's heard that <laughs> bullshit what about you how did your life change when you finally were able to acknowledge and empower and upgrade and it got way happier 
for one thing, mm -hmm. because it's like all of my life I had this yearning in the pit of my gut. I knew there was something I was supposed to do. Right. What am I here for? Right. Right. But I didn't know, and I tried all kinds of things, and databases felt pretty good for a while. It was very empowering, right. helping people to manage their stuff. But nothing really, eh. But the Akashic Records, from the very first, it was like, like I said, the angels sung, and I right. was home. Yeah. And it, I tell people, when you find what feeds your soul, because mm -hmm. that's what we're all seeking, Right. that's when your life really begins. Mm -hmm. So my life didn't begin until my mid-50s. Mm -hmm. And now I'm on fire to make up for lost time. <laughs> <laughs> and P.S. There's something about working in the fifth dimension that energizes, and I think it reverse ages you because I feel like I'm in my 30s, and I'm now 62. Oh, so yeah. it's like wow. I recommend it for everybody. Get some <laughs> of that fifth dimensional juice. <laughs> That's the fountain of youth. Yeah. There you, you go. Get, you don't get sick as often, right? right. Because when you're channeling that healing energy to other yes. people. It's passing through you. Yes. And so you're getting that residual benefit. Yep. It's it's, it's like, amazing. It is. It's definitely we're the conduit and we're just bringing it in and you know people always say, well, isn't too much doing reiki too many times or, or, or overwhelms you and I'm like, no, it actually energizes mm -hmm. me. You know, of course, yes, 24/7, no, you can't do that because at some point your body needs a rest. Well, you have to respect it, right? right? Yeah. This is your vessel yep. to be here, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there is part of you attached to the physical plane, and that that part needs to be respected because uh, look what happened to the father of the Akashic Records. Mm. You wanna, do you, are you familiar with his story, or? Did something, I don't know if anything bad happened to him, I just know he used to do the, the trances to well, he got me. caught up in one, from what I understand, and he I never, never came that. back. Oh. Isn't that? Yes, that's, I remember now. You're yeah. not talking about Edgar Casey, then. You're talk you are. Okay. No, I didn't hear that story. It's fascinating. Yes. I've always felt connected to him. Right. Well, you ha we're all connected. Right. Yeah. The illusion of separation, again, is another tool that, for lack of a better term, I'll say the military-industrial complex mm -hmm. uses... Mm -hmm to keep us at each other so we don't unify and stop letting them play their game. But, you know, so, so to me, I mean, that's, that's how you read people is, you know, you just get on that frequency and, you know, when, once they're distracted and they get the hell out of their own way and your, your higher selves talk to their higher self and, you know, that's, that's when the magic happens. So, you know, another one I just turned someone on to is Joseph Campbell. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with? Love Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Joseph Campbell was transformational for me because when he explained that Jesus' story is not original, right. that took care of that whole conflict about reincarnation oh, for me because yes. I couldn't justify it. It's like, if Jesus died for our sins, right. then why do we have to reincarnate? Right. Didn't right. make sense to me. Mm -hmm. But then I, I listened to Joseph Campbell and it's like, okay now we're talking now it all makes sense mm -hmm. and so what people need to understand is that even though i talk about jesus a lot because i'm very connected to jesus right always have been it's not in that religious sense right. jesus just happens to be the guide that comes for me a lot right. right you know i also get a lot of others in the beginning it's funny they all had biblical names <laughs> right. you know, like and i say <laughs> and i got ezekiel right or, you know. but then that as changes an as, as an ascended master that's how he comes yeah. to me not as, as a wise loving force. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, and like Metatron who oversees the records, right. what I get from Metatron is this humongous love and concern for humanity. Yes. And well Metatron don't take no shit. <laughs> oh, he's pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah. Right. He just right. he really cares well, about us. That's why he's in charge of the records, because he he can Whip Close anybody. the book. He could whip anybody into shape if yeah. he needs to. Um, and just just to give a little footnote, Joseph Campbell is what I like to call the grandfather of Star Wars. And there's a wonderful series that you can hook up with called The Power of Myth, which is a six-part series he recorded from the Lucas Ranch with Bill Moyer. And it's 
very illuminating. And I was just, like I said, I was just talking to someone this week about that, uh, and I, I hope he took my suggestion and, and he's looking into that. But yeah, to me, it was it was very transformational as yeah. well. And I actually started finding out about him when I was very much younger, because again, you know, I was a handful, and and I'm st actually I'm. I'm more of a truckload now. But, you know, it, when you get the opportunity to see these documentation in mainstream acceptance, to me it's very heartwarming because this is stuff that even back in World War II, the Germans were looking into and trying to figure out how to suppress and control and manipulate and yeah, make right. it work for them. Exactly. And, and because that's not really something they want you to know, a lot of that stuff's been suppressed. But, you know, it, it even goes back to Tesla, and, and that's as far back as I want to go because, you know, a lot of that is still documented, and mm -hmm. you can still look up the writings and, and understand the concept of everything is energy. Even, even we... Our illumination, uh, not illuminations, but illusions of solidity. Right. You know, we are not technically solid. Everything is energy. I know. I keep trying well, to rearrange my there. molecules, I but it doesn't know. work yet. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of salt. Never mind. But yeah, <laughs> the power of myth is just so phenomenal. And consciousness expansion, oh, right? Yes. Which is what we're here for. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So... At some point, I don't know where, somebody had asked me for your information, and I want you to give it to them how they could find you. We're well, the exciting it. part is gonna that gonna we're going to kind of join forces, are we not? Yes. Yes. We are? Yes. We haven't talked about that yet. Yes, I know. Oh, cool. Well, ahead. Exciting. But I know. Yeah, I is, is this news to you? I mean, I know it, it, you have well, an ink the documents. No. When but I met Glenda, I felt that connection. Yes. I told her she looks like my aunt <laughs> who I adored. So there was that to start with, not to mention the energy, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Absolutely. So, well, they can find my book on Amazon.com. It's Akasha Unleashed, the missing manual to you. They can go to my website, which is AkashaUnleashed.com, and there's a tab for meditations. So I invite you to go to akashaunleashed.com slash meditations with an S. Grab any of those you want. They're all divine downloads, and they're available to you to use as often as you like. There are some really cool ones there that I think you'll like a lot, so check them out. Okay, yeah. so again, because I, I kind of like to help people that may not be up to speed, when you say divine downloads, I know you know what that means. Mm -hmm. Yes. But how would you explain that to the unindoctrinated? That means when I'm connected to the fifth dimension, this is the information that's coming through to me. And so I will either speak it into a recorder as it's coming, because it comes fast, mm -hmm. or I've got my hands on the keyboard typing as fast as I can. But the cool thing, I love to tell people this, you can say to them, okay, you're going a little too fast, can you pause? Right. And they will. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Pause, and then when you're ready, we pick it right back up again. Right. So yeah. this comes under, aside from channeling, which is what you would do into an audio device, automatic writing, effectively, right. because you're not consciously thinking this. This is something I that's... I am. I'm, I'm always conscious when I'm channeling, so it's not like I ever lose control of my body like some channels do. Right. I'm always conscious, and in fact, I'm the translator, so I'm getting this stuff. It's coming through, and as I'm typing, sometimes I have to pause because I can't get the right word. Right. So there is that consciousness there. But what I mean to say is that you are not creating this information. You're the conduit. No, and the stuff that comes through, I could not make it up. And, and that's, you know, th there's an old saying that the truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, that was the point I was trying to make, not necessarily that you go into some kind of a trance and you're not able to communicate because ideally they want you to communicate because free will is... I hate to use this word, the trump card. You know, yep. <laughs> free will is is the one thing we have to make or break our existence in this lifetime. Right. So anybody that tells you you have to give that up. Mm, mm, yeah, they're not communicating with the right place. No, nope, no. Nope, yeah. And nope. and they're basically trying to use you for their own yeah. manipulation. Well, and along with that, free will is like the golden rule for 
the heavenlies, right? Exactly. For all of our connections. So it's like if you ever get one of those guides or someone telling you what to do, mm. it's not coming from there. No. Nope. No. Maybe it's ego. Maybe it's something else. And you know, you can suggest. You could say, you know. Yeah, they give you options. Options. And even if you say this cup is pink, you may see the pink, but you also want it to be white because it is pink and white. It's all up to you. If you give, you're, you're like me where you just give whatever it comes, but it's the person who has to really do mm -hmm. the work and take whatever path resonates with them at that moment. Yeah. And there's that responsibility because if you leave out a small detail, yeah. it might have been that one crucial part that they needed to put it all together. Right. So it's like, boy, you got to really focus and get all those details. And you cannot put your two cents into it. No. You My know, opinion doesn't matter. If you're getting it as the color pink, then you got to say the color pink because mm -hmm. that could be just the key. Could be their color and it means something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the definition of communication is message sent equals message received. So you can't get caught up in what you want it to be or what you think it should be. And again, you know, when I was in my formative years, I had a lot of interest in psychology prior to my work with the various mental health associations. And my challenge was they were all telling me what wellness is supposed to look like. And depending on what doctor you have or, you know, what school of psychology you're following, they have their criteria for wellness. And, you know, that's very culturally motivated. That's, again, people trying to tell someone else who they're supposed to be and how they're supposed to be. And that never re resonated with me. So I had a lot of challenge with it. And I found this particular coaching modality is you never tell a client what to do. That's your life. And they're not here to live your life. They're here to live their life. So at the best, if something doesn't make sense to you, then you can ask the question, well, why is it this way? And you don't even say, why isn't it that way? Because the questions are always supposed to be open. You're never mm -hmm. supposed to feed them an answer. Right. Um, and, and let them discover it for themselves. And that's the fun again, because when they get to that aha moment, yeah, why is it that way? And... I wound up working with a lot of professionals. And you know what the money question was? What do you tell a client that says that? Mm -hmm. yep. And all of a sudden they realized that they're no better than the client. So they have to give themselves the same permission. I mean, you talk about people that are have the level of the bar up here about how they're supposed to be, you know, and all of a sudden their whole world shifted because they realized that they're not any better than the client. No one's any better than anyone else. We all have different gifts. We all have different predispositions, but nobody's better. That's, that's a man-made. Yeah. It's like creator has this big recipe, this big pot of stew. Right. And we're all different ingredients. Yes. Different spices. We're all yes. unique. Yes. And what a very boring world this would be if we were all exactly the same. Yeah. Mm. And how many years have we spent being trained to conform? Yes. Into and this little box, into this little train, into this little thing. Just and that's where I was going when I asked you, you know, how you became confined before you expanded. Because, you know, I always find that those stories to be very interesting and when other people hear them, mm -hmm. then that kind of gives them permission to, to question that. People that have never f had the permission to question anything. So Well, as women, we're taught to be the good oh. little girls, to take care of everybody, to be perfect and to be pleasing. That's a box. That's, That's a, a box. massive box. And, and we have to think of ourselves last. It occurred to me only about two years ago. One day I'm walking out my back door, and it, it's like, it's really wonderful to have an opinion. Yes. Because, <laughs> yes. you know, for so many years, it's like everybody else's choices mattered more than mine. Right. So you become the mom, you become the, the yeah. daughter, you become the wife, but never really yourself. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wait a second. Where, where am I into, in this equation? And that's when you, it's enlightening and it's very freeing. 
that's how it felt for me. And hard to believe, but yes, I was, for a long time, I was that, yes, 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 yes. And now, poor soul, he's got no, 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 no. <laughs> it would be boring the other yes, way. Yes, it would be. <laughs> so this leads me to begging the question. When you look back into previous lifetimes, do you literally get gender or race for an individual? And, um, and no. is that fluid? In other words, you know, a lot of people, I, I tell a lot of people that, you know, you better be nice to the women because you're going to come back as one in your mm -hmm. next life. Just to basically get them to think about it, whether I know it or not. So how do you weigh in on that? It's true. When you were created, all right. of us, we got a gender. Right. And that's probably because creator wanted a, a certain amount of us, right? So right. that we could procreate, right. which makes sense. Mm -hmm. But then after that, each time you incarnate, you get to choose what gender you will be. Right. And so we've all been all the genders. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's androgynous. Yes. That's also a category. But what I'm finding now is that some people are starting to come to me with transgender issues and it turns out that, yeah, their physical body is a different gender from their soul. Right. Probably what's happened is they've done this gender swapping thing enough. Right. And they probably will never incarnate the opposite gender again. They've learned all they needed. Right. And it's just, it's not comfortable this time. Mm. Now, I would love to get a lot of data and do some research and find out, is that the majority? Of the issues, because uh, I don't have enough data now to know. Right, right. right. But and we it's certainly sure don't want to create any havoc for no. people who have transgender. No, we're not challenges. Not saying right. that at all. No. It's it's a question for me. Yeah. Right. How many yeah. people is that the case? But yeah, there's definitely a gender and race. Yeah, mm. I've seen myself as a black woman in you know like 1800s. I was somebody's maid. Mm -hmm. I've seen other people who had different races. So, yeah, I mean, because we've experienced it all. Right. Then we have Thousands to. of incarnations, and you get bored, right? And you had to, because you come, you keep coming back to learn a lesson mm -hmm. and to evolve. So, you have to look at things from different yeah, perspectives. Yeah, so white supremacists, watch out. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next one could be interesting for you. But it's the soul's choice when they right. incarnate. Right. So, it's when you get that perspective, when you're a soul, you're not in a body, and you're looking at all those experiences, and you're choosing, what do I want to work on next? Exactly. Then very often they will choose something like that, a challenging situation, right. because they want to take care of that karma and resolve it. Right. Now, my next question, because we've all heard stories about children who suddenly start remembering where they were, and there's a very famous one about a child in the Middle East they actually took him back and mm -hmm. found his murderer. And I think his murderer got convicted yeah. from the previous life. What is the youngest, do you call them regressions or, or just do you call them? No, Akashic regressions records? are something, something else. Something right. else. Right. But what, what is the youngest person, client, you will comfortably work with, with parental permission, of course, to look at Akashic records and, you know, help them resolve something if, if they're seriously evicted and, and they come to you and say, you know, I, I can't sleep at night because this isn't who I am. I'm this person and, and I remember this place and this and that. And, and, you know, people, children can do it at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So do you have a cutoff, per se, of someone that you I will? I really, I don't have a rule about that, but you you don't want to read for a baby before six weeks because the soul is still getting settled in the body. Right. right. So you don't want to interfere with that. Right. But after that, you can. Now, what I would say with a child is, why would you be going and digging for all that karmic stuff if you didn't have a reason? Right. Mm -hmm. So normally it's going to be adults who care about this, right? Right. right. So reading for a child, what that would be, that would be, let's talk about the aspects of the soul. What are the characteristics of this child? Mm -hmm. What What's the gift? What are the superpowers that this baby's going to have that you can now nurture and help them to really be empowered and step into their gift as they mature? Right. That would be what you'd want to do with a child. Now, you ask about regressions. So regressions, their purpose is very different. Right. They're actually going, they want that whole story. They want to dig around in that muck and learn about right. it. Right. 
Right. When we do it in the Akashic Records, it's maybe this much. We'll get just the piece we need right. to teach us about the trauma mm -hmm. so that we can resolve it. Because, again, the focus is on soul evolution in this life yeah. as opposed to beating yourself up or reliving who, who beat you up mm. in the past life. Uh, but how did you find out about the six-week thing? Is that religious dogma? Did, did you get that I inherently told to you at some point? I was taught that. Okay. And it felt right to me, so I never questioned it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not questioning it. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I just... Yeah, there's been a lot of things I learned through curriculum that I've studied. Mm -hmm. Some of it I now use, some of right. it I've discarded. So it's like part of my journey, figuring out what's really true. Well, again... And what I, resonates with you. Yeah. I think we all have different predispositions. And so something can be true, but maybe superfluous to us. So it's not going to be part of the toolkit. Yeah. Because, you know, we do it a different way. Well, it's like Glenda and the tarot cards. Right. Right. It's You're wired differently. Mm -hmm. So whoever taught you, they taught you from their mm -hmm. gift perspective. Right. And you're probably wired differently, so you're going to do it differently. Right. And that's the incredible thing about her is because she's constantly looking into different modalities to expand her horizon. And she's very humble, so she doesn't really talk about it a lot. And, and I'm going to take a beating later for talking about it here. But, you know, to me... Someone who sits there and goes, okay, this is what I do. This is where I'm going to make my money, and I'm just going to do this because this is working for me, and I'm going to get rich doing this. That sets off red flags for me. Whereas somebody who's humble and comes in there and says, I know this, but I still have more to learn. Let me learn this, and let me learn that. And, you know, in Reiki, for instance, you know, she has 20 attunements in Usui alone. And that's not her only modality. She's constantly out there trying to expand herself and, and develop and all of that. And I'm freaking tired. You know, I just want to say, I want a day off once in a while, you know? <laughs> Give me a day. I know, I know you're doing most of the work, but, you know. No, I'm just kidding. I just like to get more tools to my toolbox. Yeah. So I have them there so I can use them. Because... A client could come in and request certain thing, and when you really look into it, that's not what they're looking for. That's not really what they need. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the only reason I do that. So it's really not about you. It's about no. being able to be there for that client of course. who may need. But this, to me, again, is a way for people to know that the person they're with is, is real or not because... In a way, they're always looking to be more efficient, we'll say. Well, none of us know it all. Right. So if we get to that place where we think we do, that's a problem. Yes. You know, we're all expanding and learning and growing. That's the journey. Because when you finish that, you're done. Exactly. And then you're ready for the next uh, adventure. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's exactly the way I look at it. And I tell people, I, I've studied for years now. Right. I know this much. Because yep. it is vast. Yes. There's so much. And even people who do the exact same thing I do, they, each one of us does it differently. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. Because even with dentists or doctors, you resonate with certain ones better than you do with other ones. Absolutely. And they could have gone to the same schools and learned exactly the same thing. But just the way you connect with them. Well, when I was back in grade school, we were asked to choose a motto. And my motto was, well, there's much I don't know, there's nothing I can't learn. And the challenge is today, a lot of times, if, if you're asking me something, I'll speak, if I've experienced it, from a lot of confidence, but I'll make it clear that this is from my experience. Well, people hear the confidence, and they presume that I'm not open to other modalities or other things. And, you know, that becomes a bit of a challenge, plus the fact that I can, I'm told, be a little intimidating. But <laughs> He has been told that a lot by this one good friend of ours who, thankfully, she, had the, she was the only one that had the courage to tell him. 
and she's still living, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's just fun for me, again, <laughs> to be able to distinguish people who come up and say, oh, this and this and this, and you should do this, and you should. That should is, yeah, a red flag. Yeah. So where do we go from here? What are you looking to do to be able to reach more people? My passion is doing the live channeling. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, the, the whole story is I came to this realization because people always say, do the thing that lights you up, that's right. easy for you. Right. I could channel all day and be happy. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's so wonderful. And so I was starting to step into this idea, and I started telling people, Think of me like the Esther Hicks of the Akashic Records. Because okay. they couldn't understand what I was talking about. Right. right? right. So that's a visual they can connect with. So Or Google. Yeah, or Google. <laughs> Google. So then one day, all of a sudden, I get this, you're not Esther Hicks. You're the voice of the Akashic Records. <laughs> I am? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And so I've been slowly kind of incorporating that and getting comfortable with it. Right. It's like um, you outgrow your shoes, they get too tight, and you got to get a new pair. Yeah, it's, it's starting to feel comfortable. So what my next step is, is to travel and to do these live events, like yes. Esther does. Although I'm not into the cruise ship thing. Uh. But, you know, I just want to get out there and get it to more people because they need it. Yes. And look at the mess this world is in. Oh, please. If we can get more people connected to their soul, oh. we're going to make a massive ripple that's yeah. going to change things. Yes. That's what we need. Exactly, healing, healing, and healing. So yeah, and now, making it fun too. It's got to yes. be fun. Yeah, of course. I'm a Gemini. It has to be fun. Yes. Oh, oh Lord, if it isn't, oh, <laughs> that's not a good thing. And you know, like 85 percent of the world's population has low self-esteem. Yes. And mine used to be like in the basement, mm -hmm. and it took a lot of years to get past that. In fact, when I was at my family reunion in July, one of the the family, you know, they've been keeping track of what I was doing, right. and they, you know, they were giving me some praise and saying how cool it is, and I don't know what prompted this, because I've never done this before, uh -huh. but I looked at them, and I smiled, and I said, yeah, I'm pretty terrific. <laughs> Good for you. And that was a new thing. Good for you. You know, I've gotten to the place where I do love myself now, which right. I didn't understand for a long time, yeah. how people love themselves. It was incongruent. Yeah, you could kind of like yourself, you could kind of love what you did at that very yeah. moment, but sometimes that deep love of yourself and yeah. knowing that what you are is more than enough. And, and that comes from the Akashic Records. Yes. Because constantly, mm -hmm. when I'm reading for people, I'm getting right. this message, you are magnificent, you are brilliant, you are resplendent, you right. are perfect. Yes. Stop judging yourself, and tomorrow you're going to be more perfect. Mm -hmm. And if God tells you that, um, oh, I'm it. not arguing with God. No. Nope. Okay, I'm perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so after hearing it for others enough, mm -hmm. it finally took with me. And, you know, I finally got to that place. But And we're yeah. back to that money question. What would you tell a client? <laughs> well, guess what? You too. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and it's part, it always, you know, these messages that come through, even though they might be for one person, yes. they're broadly applicable because it's divine truth. Right. Exactly, and and that's what I I do the same thing when we do the the mediumship uh, development classes. I say, get a message for the the sitter and a message for the group. And usually, when somebody brings a message for the sitter, it's a message for themselves too. And mm -hmm. I don't tell them that, but you know, you could see that in their you could see their eyes and they light like, up. They light up and they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And the fun yeah. part for me is, and a lot of people in the group don't realize this, is we could have 20 entities in the room. You know, usually it's more than one entity per person. But she's the ringmaster. Mm -hmm. And she's basically keeping all of those entities in their various perspective places so that, you know, they are respectful of the client and like. You know, they'll be speaking too fast, and the client will say, I, 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 he's speaking too fast. Tell him to slow down. Yeah. Because, again, the biggest challenge I see in people is owning their power, you know, yeah. and, and balancing what your power is. Because, basically, we're all conduits, yeah. you know, and, and once you accept that and understand what that means, 
then you can keep your ego in perspective. But even as a conduit, your free will is still the master of your life. You know, and hopefully you use that for greatest good. But trying to help people to understand that, particularly people who have been traumatized, and there's a lot of trauma, not only in past lives, but in this life. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be the mechanism in play to keep people obedient and manageable. Well, if you think about, like the Christian Bible, because that's what right. I'm familiar with, right. what are we taught? We are all these horrible sinners, and we have to grovel to God and beg for just a little bit of love and acceptance. Yeah. And that's not what God's saying. No. That's what people said. Yeah. And they use that to control us. Mm -hmm. So I got this epiphany a few weeks ago. It's like religion equals control, spirituality equals freedom. Yeah. And I'm more connected from a spirituality point than I ever was mm -hmm. through anything I got through religion. And so here we are, and it's like, stop thinking that you're worthless and you have to grovel. Your creator adores you. And, and if you go with that other teaching, what is that saying? That's saying God made a bunch of imperfect junk. Yeah, and he or she, the they creator, found it. right, right. <laughs> the creator created perfect. There was no reason not to. Perfect with purpose. Yes. Not just perfect to go and, and stare at your navel all day. Right. <laughs> no, seriously. We we all have we're all here for our soul fulfillment. You know, providing that we are part of the whole. The greatest good includes us. Right. And, and includes everyone. So, you know, if, if we're all perfect and perfect, perfect with purpose, then all you got to do is figure out what that purpose is. And the beauty is that purpose evolves. Yes. As we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I used to laugh back again when I was younger and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I tried to look at how the world was changing and, and just about everything I saw that was going to go away that I could have done went away. But again, I came back to energy. And that's sort of where I began my focus in more of a physical energy construct that, you know, energy that they've been able to manage. Uh, but that's led me to the idea that the energy is beyond our perception. And you really have to begin to open yourself up to realize how the energy works and how to become resonant with the energy as opposed to fighting it. Mm -hmm. Now, before I forget this, how does a session with you take place? Like, what is your usual way of doing things? Um, you know, for me, for example, somebody comes for Reiki, I talk to them, I explain it to them, I put music, I put them kind of in a meditative state, and do the you know, the Reiki session by checking their chakras first and all that other stuff. Do you have a procedure or do you just go intuitively? Generally, we do it remotely right? because I work with people all over the world. Right. So it's usually on the phone or on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so I just ask them to get comfortable and relax. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about taking notes because I'm going to record the whole thing for you. Right. I want you to be present. Right. Don't worry about notes. And then, depending on what kind of reading is, right. I'll go in and I'll get the information. They're free to interrupt and ask questions mm -hmm. because, like I said, I can hit pause. Right. 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 And we just we flow with it. However, the information is leading us, and sometimes we'll have to probe a little bit with the symbology to figure out how does this fit. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But like this one guy, I go in, and I I see it sometimes as stepping over the threshold into the records. Right. And I'm standing in cold, dark seawater. And it's like, this is really weird. I've never uh, experienced that before. And then the, the reading went on, and it, it turned into Jungle Book. So we got okay. the message from the python, okay. which was cool. Transformation, <laughs> well, right? There you go. There you go. 
a year later, the man's living on a houseboat. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't know if he made the connection. But when I found out he's living on the houseboat, and then I'm thinking back to his reading, okay, now that makes sense. So sometimes there's a delay mm. in figuring out what some of this stuff is about. Right. Well, again, time is a man-made construct. Yeah. So. It's Sometimes it's like God winks, you know. It's, it's kind of ribbing you a little in a hint and teasing. Yes. Oh, they have lot. a hell of a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yes, definitely. And that's what they're always encouraging us. Connect with your inner child. Yes. Get that joy and that inquisitiveness and approach your life from there. And it's so much more fun. And look at everything through the eyes of a child. Mm -hmm. You know, the wonder, the, the beauty of things. Like, I, I see fireflies and I still go, you know, I'm driving, I'm like, oh, isn't that beautiful? They look like little stars. And, you know, and, and people are looking at me like, you're weird. I'm like, no, I, I'm enjoying this. There's beauty in everything, even hurricanes. There's beauty in that. Mm -hmm. There's beauty in every little thing that this world experiences or you experience. You yeah. just have to look at it from a different point of view. And that brings us to the song I channeled for my son, through the eyes of a child, <laughs> which uh, the hook is through your eyes, I can see the bright tomorrows, where again, I am young and free and wild. Through your eyes, as your joys replace my sorrows, I live again through the eyes of a child. Now, I made that about him, but to me, it's about connecting with your inner child. I used right. to do guided meditations to reconnect people with their inner child. So, you know, I... This is fun for me because it sounds like we're very much on a similar vector. Mm -hmm. and music comes through a lot. Yes. I was thinking, though, you know, my musical tastes are more the old stuff. Uh -huh. I don't know what's going to happen if they try and play me a rap song. I'm not going to know what to do with it. But <laughs> fortunately, so far, it's all been stuff I can relate to, and then I can help them to see how it relates to their situation. Well, I used to freak people out because I, I had someone who was really into the old stuff for his generation, and you know his thing was doo-wop. And I was like, yo, you do realize that doo-wop is white rap, right? <laughs> You know, yip, 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 boom, 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 get ya. Bowser. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And even before Bowser. But, you know, everybody doesn't realize what an oral tribal race humanity is. Mm. And so it just keeps reinventing itself. Mm. Yes. But it's all where you pick it up and, and what you gravitate to and what moves you. And, you know... I, I'm happy that I've written in all different types of genres of music, but they come to me, you know, mm -hmm. and... Um, Don't you think the best ones do? Yes. I think so many of those songs are channeled. Oh, definitely. I think so. I mean, Amy Winehouse, she must have been so awake and so connected and channeled all that music. Yes. And these little kids, these child prodigies, they're just awake. They're connecting with their gift that they've had probably for many lives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, I think we're all born with gifts. It's just a matter of whether we're able to expand mm -hmm. or we have to close them because, you know, the environment and that's, you know, evil and that's devil's work and all that other stuff where it, it's very different. Like my kids, I allowed them to expand and they take their gifts to wherever they got to go with it. Without her pressuring them, which yes. is wonderful. Yeah, I don't pressure anybody into anything. As a matter Except of fact, me. well, okay. <laughs> As a matter of fact, a lot of people were saying, "You letting them do that?" Yeah, if all they're doing is joking with me, it's not being disrespectful to me. Mm -hmm. We're joking, and they know the line. They always knew the line. As a matter of fact. My daughter one time said shit, and I did not want that. I did not want any cursing in my presence. And she's like, I said, ship, I said, ship, I said, ship. No, too late. She got soap in her mouth, and that was the only time. And now she spells it. Even to this day, she spells the words. And I'm like, it's okay. You're an adult now. And she still spells it. They all do. They, they spell whatever curse word in front of me. They don't well, even I'm say so glad it. I used the word crap in that story earlier because <laughs> the client didn't. 
And there you go. <laughs> it was like Third so, base. so funny because to this day, she still spells it. And I'm like, I'm like, okay. But you know you could say it now. You, you know, you're 25. I understand. I just didn't want you to do it when you were young because mm -hmm. then you could say it in front of anybody yeah. and they would get offended and all that other stuff. But it was, it's still to this day. And she's like, that first minute, oh, this is nothing. Okay. I take out the soap and then. Then it was something. Then it was, <laughs> then it was something. She it's did. still something. <laughs> yeah. She kind of left a bad taste in her mouth. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, and, and people, it wasn't one of those chemical bad soaps. It was a natural soap. It just had lavender in it. <laughs> and pe and uh, tree, tree, uh, petri, tree oil? Yeah, petri, petri oil. oil. <laughs> and needless to say, she never cursed in front of me ever again. But the idea was that I preferred picking my battles with them. Mm -hmm. My eldest loved long hair. And people used to say, why are you letting him have the long hair? I don't care. He's the one that's got to look at himself in the mirror. I just see him as he's coming back and forth real quick. You know, and it's like, well, that's terrible. He looks like a girl. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and that's then I would look at them and go, well, is he turning you on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's that's me. You know, it's, it's like it's really your issue. Understand that it's your issue. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to music, I've really been very blessed because I, I worked 23 years at Madison Square Garden and I bounced off a lot of incredible musicians. And I tell the story because you can really, you know, when you talk about people that are on a higher level of vibrational energy, I had met Paul McCartney and we had a brief five minute discussion at his discretion. 20 years later, I did a press conference for him. And he walks in, and he didn't know I was there, and we really hadn't spoken in 20 years. And he looks around the room like you know most people do when they walk into a room crowd of people. Hey, Larry! And that, to me, says so much about his presence and yes. mm -hmm. you know where his mind is. Of, of all the thousands of people that he knows intimately, to, to really be able to recollect me you know it ain't me yeah <laughs> so i give it all to him but there's something about music and musicians when they sit and play together and they are together there is that one consciousness that allows them to do that it's like you connect on soul level right. so you're going to remember exactly yeah where too too bad that not so many people don't do that they should not, not, I'm not talking about playing music, but connect with each other in a different level. Um, it's like, you know, you, you talk about friends and you, you have people that you know and you could maybe not even talk to them for a year, but yet you pick up the phone, you call them up and you caught up like this because you're in a different level. You're not in the, yeah. oh, the ego level. You're in the really deep down I really care about you. They care about, you know, what happens to you. And we're just completely different. And people don't understand that that's what we really need to heal ourselves, to evolve, and heal the world. Because right now, this world needs a lot of healing. So if I understand you correctly, your next step that you're looking forward to is galleries. You're looking to do groups of people in different areas. Events, yeah, yeah. But are you looking to do an individual at one time at the event, or are you looking to basically get a group of people and kind of... I think it would be a mixture, because there's the more I do it, there's probably going to be a message that comes for the collective. Right. And then, you know, just choose people from the audience and channel for them. So it would be mm -hmm. from their records. Nice. So what size groups are you looking for in, in your mind at the moment? Again... You know, I, it's, it's, I understand it's in its infancy stage and it's yeah. going to evolve, but how do you see it unfolding? As many people as we can get in a room. Because like I said, I can do this for hours. It energizes me. I love it. Great. Good. 
So, you know, we get a room full of 50 people. That's yeah. great. We yeah. get a few hundred. That's great. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exciting. Isn't it? It's it is. Yeah, I keep thinking I want to do a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So whatever the people pay would go for some cause. Right. The problem is, who's going to do a fundraiser with a psychic? They already have to be tuned into it. Well. But if there's somebody out there listening who wants to do a fundraiser, Hello. We already hey, have I'm one. We have in um, the hopper. Yeah. And that must be what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mention fundraiser. The higher and the higher over there. And you, you know, I have to still earn a living because I got a mortgage. Oh, I'd, I'd do this for free them. if I didn't. Oh, of course. But just we all do. And I, but with I that, let me just really stop you for a second. Do that. Yeah. If <clears throat> someone is, if if you really need someone and you have a message for them and they can't pay, you're not going to withhold that message because no, they because can't pay. No, because if I'm just talking to somebody, yeah. I often get hits. Right. Yeah. I have to share it. I wouldn't have gotten it if I wasn't supposed to share it. Because yeah. that was a lot of yeah. the attack that I was getting. Was, oh, you were just in it for the money. And I'm like, well, go to the website and look at some of the videos. Yeah, I give oh, you're just stuff. looking for views. Yeah. People are funny. You know? And plus, I have that monthly group where they can come. So yeah. I tell people, if you... If your budget doesn't mm -hmm. allow a reading, because mm -hmm. they're not cheap, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, then come for crying out loud to this free event. Yep. You can ask your question. You'll get your three, five minutes, whatever it takes. Right. Once in a while, we get one that goes 10, mm -hmm. but we try to keep it short. <laughs> so you're not going to get a full-fledged reading, but you're going to get an answer to that question. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And again, that's another way that, and not that I had any question about you, that I'm aware that someone is is for the higher purpose because they're not looking to sell you a plan mm -hmm. I mean even Glenda how often do you see a client for a reading quite often <laughs> but no but what I mean to say that you always space a gap in between yes, yes. you don't have someone coming every week for a reading per se no 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 yeah no, if they're doing that there's something yeah. wrong yeah no exactly. they're not doing uh, their own work no not only that I will I will. I feel like I'm taking their money, because what uh, what new stuff can I tell them? Well, there's not a, there's not a satisfaction for you if they're right. going to keep doing that either. Exactly. You want to feel like you made a difference, right? Uh, exactly. Most people I work with, we do that one big reading, and then I may not ever hear from them again because mm -hmm. it's it's massive. Exactly. They often walk away, and it's like I hit them in the head with a two by four. <laughs> You know, well, there's a lot of people, you say... just gave me an idea, a lot of people I want to bring to see you because they can use a hit in the head with a two-by-four, <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. Well, I'd like to thank you. Uh, it was really great. Guys, the, the website is right in the uh, chat room, and I'll re continue posting it. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming on here and explaining everything. And thank you, LD, for not shutting up. Thanks for being uh, comic relief. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as long uh, as it's relief. Everybody have a great week. Well, before we go, mm. real quick, Snow, you have a book out. Yes. Yeah, you have a book out. So, okay. So? Tell us about it. Plug your damn book there. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, um, I have a poetry book out. Um, it's kind of about life the way I see it. So I call it The Snowstorm because uh, my life is a mess. And uh, all the poems are really like deep. They're they're written with the intent to be like spoken word poems. So mm -hmm. you could take all of them on stage, and they really just um, highlight how I how I see the world. You know, what I'm saying based on either some of my experiences or experiences I was blessed to be able to watch from the outside and not have to take part in. But um, yeah, and how do people get a hold of you? If they either want to, you know, connect to your live performances, because I know you do do open mics sometimes. Yeah. Or whatever. Do you have a way that people can reach out to you on the internet and, and get apprised of, or at least even figure out how to purchase your book? Because I've heard some of what you do, and it's incredible. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. You, thank you, you did it. Um, I just freaking listen. <laughs> um, you could go on my Facebook. Um, my name on there is Jason King Snow. Um, also, my Instagram, Eskimo.Snow. Uh, the link to my book should be in there. I'm working on getting it in more places. So right now, the um, the ebook is available on Amazon Kindle. 
Um, and the physical copy is available on blurb.com. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm working on getting it at much more places very soon. Yes. And thank you for thank doing you. such a wonderful job and allowing us to have today's show. Yes. We no appreciate doubt. it. Thank you. No doubt. I appreciate you thank guys. You. No problem. All right, guys. Have a good one. Have a blessed week. See you all next week at Gwenda's Dragon's Den.